John's final defense. Welcome, glad you're all here. So John came to us in uh, 2006, actually from the College of New Jersey, and he's a physics major. So uh, as you'll see on his dissertation defense today, that he's actually doing a lot of chemistry and a little bit of geology. So he's done actually quite a bit of modeling work, and um, so he's been. Most of his work is based on um, two years of field, two seasons of field work we did in Antarctica. And then a lot of analysis and modeling work after that. So it's, it was um, a significant amount of samples we collected. It took a lot to actually process all of that sample. So John's going to talk for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then we'll have kind of general questions. And then um, um, we'll excuse most of the audience here. The committee will stay in. Have a few more questions. Okay. Okay. John, can you talk about Yeah. All right, hi, my name is Jonathan Toner, if you don't already know already. Um, uh, thanks for coming for my final sense. Um, the title of the talk I'll be giving you today is uh, Using Salt Accumulations and Luminescence Dating uh, to Study the Glacial History of Taylor Valley, Antarctica. This is research that I've done with my advisor, Ronald Sletton, as well as my committee members, Bernard Blay, James Feathers, and Darlene Spalski. This work was funded under an NSF award and also through the Ken C. Robbins and Peter Misch Fellowship. Uh, it's also received grants from the Earth and Space Sciences Department. Uh, in addition, a, substan a substantial component of this work was done uh, down in Glenn Berger's lab uh, down in the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. So in overview, this dissertation uh, studies the past glacial history of Taylor Valley, Antarctica uh, during the last glacial maximum. And we do this uh, by looking at salt accumulations in soils, and also by dating soils using luminescence data. So this research is located within the dry valleys of Antarctica. The dry valleys are located within the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, adjacent to Mercordo Sound. The dry valleys are one of the largest uh, expanses of ice-free land in Antarctica, and this is due primarily to the Transantarctic Mountains. The Transantarctic Mountains block ice masses from the East Antarctic Ice Sheet from entering Taylor Valley, and they also block moisture uh, from falling as snow into the dry valleys. Um, as a result, the dry valleys are one of the, the driest and coldest deserts on Earth. This research focuses on Taylor Valley. Uh, Taylor Valley is distinct from other dry valleys in that you can see on its eastern end, it's open to McMurdo Sound. In the past, uh, this has allowed ice sheets that have filled McMurdo Sound uh, to enter into the mouth of uh, Taylor Valley deposit sediments. This is a diagram showing some of the, the major features in Taylor Valley. Uh, Taylor Valley can be separated into two major closed basins, Fritzl Basin and Bonnie Basin. Uh, Fritzl Basin is, is much wider and larger than Bonnie Basin. These two base, basins are separated by a large outcrop bedrock uh, called the Nussbaum Regal. Uh, this is a cross section uh, that generally follows the valley bottom of Taylor Valley. And what it shows is that these uh, closed basins are, are defined uh, by major valley thresholds in Taylor Valley. Uh, Bonnie Basin is separated from Frixel Basin by a 160 meter high threshold uh, located near the Seuss Glacier. This threshold is formed uh, by the presence of the Noose uh, Bomb Regal in this area. Frixel Basin is separated from McMurdo Sound by a, uh, a large moraine complex called Coral Ridge. Coral Ridge has an average elevation of about 100 meters and is cut by a channel at its lowest elevation of 80 meters. So these major thresholds define uh, where closed basin lakes are in Taylor Valley. So during the last, last glacial maximum, it's thought that uh, ice sheets uh, filled with Murdo Sound. On the left is a, a reconstruction of this event. In the top panel is the current configuration of ice masses in Antarctica. And in these, uh, these uh, drawings, the, the, the vertical elevation is, is greatly exaggerated. So Antarctica doesn't really look like this. Uh, in the lower left panel is a reconstruction of what ice masses would have looked like during the last glacial maximum. This comes from ice flow models. And what you can see is that ice is filling Murdo Sound. Uh, the primary source of that ice was from an expanded West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, but it also came from alpine glaciers. So because Taylor Valley is open to Murdo Sound on the east, um, the, the, low, the ice sheet filling Murdo Sound uh, entered into the mouth of Taylor Valley and formed an ice dam. 
behind this ice dam, it's thought that Taylor Valley filled with large proglacial paleolakes. This diagram on the bottom uh, shows a reconstruction of the events that are thought to have occurred during the last glacial maximum. Here you can see the lobe of the ice sheet filling the Furnace Sound that's entered into Taylor Valley, and behind it is a large proglacial uh, paleo lake. These lakes were, were massive. Uh, the lake shown here is about 40 kilometers long, it's 10 kilometers wide at its widest, and it's over 300 meters deep in places. So these lakes have important implications for the paleoclimate during the last glacial maximum, and also for uh, ice sheet dynamics. And that, this informs our, our current understanding of climate changes in ice sheets. So there are several uh, important pieces of evidence for these paleo lakes. Uh, the first is Lacustrian strand lines. These are primarily found in western Taylor Valley. Um, you can see them here. They're found up to about 300 meters elevation. Other evidence for paleo lakes are sandy terraces. These are deposits that have been interpreted as deltas that were deposited in paleo lakes. So these terraces are found up to about 300 meters elevation in Taylor Valley. And you can see uh, the maximum high stand of the paleo lakes, 350 meters, is, is determined by the elevation of these paleo lakes, of these terraces. We really question the interpretation, though, that these uh, terraces are deltas. And this comes from ground penetrating radar results. Uh, this was done by Michael Prentice in uh, Fritzl Basin. And what he found is that most of these terraces are, in fact, not deltas. There's some other form of fluvial sedimentation. The only terrace that was investigated with GPR and that was found to be a delta was a terrace located at 80 meters elevation in Fritzl Basin. Uh, the radar profile for that terrace is shown here. And you can clearly see that there are, are four set beds uh, in that terrace. So if terraces are not deltas, or if it's uncertain that these terraces are deltas, and this really uh, uh, calls into question the high paleolake hypothesis, uh, we no longer are sure if there were these high paleolakes. And so this really motivates a lot of central questions uh, of this thesis. The first question we ask is, what actually is the history of paleo lakes in Taylor Valley? And we investigate this using soluble salt accumulations to soils. Uh, this is because soluble salts uh, will be very sensitive to inundation by paleo lakes. They're by definition soluble and will dissolve. We find that when we look at the distribution of soluble salts in Taylor Valley, um, that they're not just controlled by paleo lakes, that there's other soil processes influencing these salts. So the second question I address in this presentation is, how are these salt distributions influenced by soil processes. And we do this by looking at a single soil uh, in detail to depth. And finally, we ask the question, what are the ages of terraces in Taylor Valley? And this is important because these terraces are uh, indicators of paleoic levels. Uh, we determine terrace ages uh, using luminescence dating techniques. So the dry valleys of Antarctica are in an extremely cold and dry desert. And because it's extremely dry, uh, soils in the dry valleys preserve soluble salt accumulations in the soils. Um, common salts that you find are sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, sodium nitrate. Salts like sodium nitrate there are rarely found in soils, and that's because they're extremely soluble. In other climates, they tend to leach away from the soil. So the fact that you have salt accumulations like sodium nitrate is a testament to how dry this environment is. These salts are sourced from three main sources, uh, sea spray aerosols, atmospheric aerosols, and chemical weathering. Sea spray aerosols are sourced from Murdo Sound and they're blown inwards towards the Jai Valleys by catabatic winds. Atmospheric aerosols are initially sourced from uh, tropical oceans. Uh, nitrogen and sulfur compounds in those oceans get carried up into the upper atmosphere. And there they get oxidized to sulfate and nitrate the, that sulfate and nitrate is then precipitated onto the eastern Antarctic ice sheet as snow and carried down to the dry valleys by catabatic winds. Salts also enter the soils through chemical weathering. Uh, chemical weathering is really slow in this environment because it's extremely cold and dry, uh, but over long time scales it does occur and results in accumulations of salt. So soluble salts and soils can be redistributed by lakes, and this is uh, why we're looking at soluble salts. So soluble salts can, one, they can be leached uh, by paleo lakes. The idea is, is that before any lakes come to the landscape, soluble salts are accumulating, and this results in high soluble salt uh, contents across the landscape. 
when pale lakes rise up, uh, inundated soils are leached of their soluble salts. And when those lakes lower, you're left with a, a characteristic distribution of high salts at high elevations and low salts at low elevations. Soluble salts can also accumulate uh, near lake margins, and this is less intuitive. Uh, this happens through a process called evapoconcentration. And what happens is, near lake margins, the soils will draw lake water upwards by capillary action. Uh, that lake water then evaporates near the soil surface, and ions that were dissolved in that lake water are precipitated into the upper soil. So this causes salt to accumulate in the soil, and the amount of salt that accumulates is dependent on, one, the salinity of the lake, and it's also dependent on how stable the lake margin is. Lake margins that stay at the same elevation for long periods of time uh, can evapoconcentration can proceed for very long periods of time, and you can get very high concentrations of soluble salt in the soil. So, so to look at soluble salt distributions and to, to look at this, uh, the question of where pale lakes were, we sampled soils throughout Taylor Valley. We sampled a total of 89 soils. Samples in this study are primarily located in eastern Taylor Valley in Fritzl Basin, although a few soils were also sampled uh, in Bonnie Basin. We complement the data in this study with data done by past researchers. In particular, Bacham sampled 58 soils uh, throughout Taylor Valley, and he analyzed them for soluble salts. And Carriage and Clambell analyzed uh, 12 soils in Taylor Valley for soluble salts. Their soils are located primarily in western Taylor Valley. And so these two data sets are, are very complementary, and it provides a, uh, a very good overview of salts in Taylor Valley. So this is uh, how we actually did the soluble salt analysis. So first we would dig a soil pit, and then we would sample the soil tip pit at various depths. We then sieve the soil to separate out the less than two millimeter size fraction. This is the size fraction that, that contains most of the salt in the soil. We then extracted salt from the soil using a 1 to 25 soil to water extraction. Basically what we would do is take 2 grams of soil, add 50 milliliters of water, and measure the salts in that solution. We measured salts in the solution using ICPOES. We measured major, major cations, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. Through ion chromatography, we analyzed nitrate, sulfate, and chloride. <coughs> and through carbon analysis, we determined the, the bicarbonate content of these, these soils. Once we have all that, that salt data, we calculate the total soluble salt content in the soil on an equivalent per meter squared uh, basis. So this is the total salt per meter squared of soil surface area to the depth of the soil. In this calculation, uh, we solve for the bulk density, and we calculate bulk density using the size fractions of the less than two meter and greater than two meter fraction, and also by assuming densities for the less than two meter size fraction of 1.55 grams per centimeter cubed, and for the uh, mineral grain density, we assume 2.72 grams per centimeter cubed. We did this because it's actually very difficult to determine bulk density in these soils because they're very loose and unconsolidated. This is an overview of soluble salts uh, in Taylor Valley. Um, blue values indicate uh, low soluble salt contents in the soil. Uh, red values indicate high soluble salt contents in the soil. What we find is that there's a, a distinct east-west trend to soluble salts. And this is primarily uh, due to soil age in Taylor Valley. In eastern Taylor Valley, uh, soils tend to be very young. These are soils that were deposited uh, by the Ross Sea ice sheet during the last glacial maximum. And so they haven't had very much time to accumulate lots of soluble salt. In western Taylor Valley, uh, soils tend to be uh, much older. Uh, between 100,000 years old up to 4 million years old. And these soils have had uh, a long time to accumulate a lot of soluble salt. So do these uh, salt distributions indicate anything about uh, paleolates? Well, first we look at, at Bonnie Basin. And this is a graph here of the total salt content in Bonnie Basin soils uh, versus their elevation. And what we find is that there's a, a distinct uh, decrease in soluble salts uh, below 300 meters elevation. And this is due to uh, leaching by paleolakes that existed up to this level. And it's consistent with paleolake high stands that are inferred from strand lines and, and terraces. So soils above 300 meters are soils that were unaffected by paleolakes. They have high salt contents due to their old age. Soils below uh, between 116 and 300 meters are glacially dammed paleolakes. 
This is because these soils lie above the bonnie pritzel threshold, and so they would have to be dammed by a, an ice mass located in eastern Taylor Valley. Soils below 116 meters are closed facing pale lakes. These are soils that lobe alive the bonnie pritzel threshold. So when you look at, uh, this is actually a, a, a more detailed image of uh, soils that are influenced by pale lakes in Taylor Valley, in Bonnie Basin in particular. What we find is that there are distinct differences in soils above 160 meters versus soils below 160 meters. Above 160 meters, soluble salt contents are relatively low. We also find that there are shorelines, uh, you can see them in the upper left. These correspond to the shorelines I showed you in the photograph previously, although they're much harder to see in this image. Uh, but these shorelines are very faint. Uh, these soils were influenced by glacially dammed pale lakes. Below 116 meters, soluble salt contents are very high, and we find that uh, they're very prominent shorelines. Uh, these were uh, soils that are influenced by closed basin lakes. And we, we find these trends are due to uh, uh, differences in pale lake stability. So glacially dammed pale lakes are dammed by ice sheet in eastern Taylor Valley. And so these lakes are sensitive to movements of that ice sheet and also for meltwater inputs. So they, they change level. Uh, in contrast, closed li basin lakes below 160 meters are much more stable because they lower slowly due to evaporation and sublimation. And as a result, uh, you can cause uh, evapocentration in the soils for long periods of time and you can incise deep, deep shorelines. So in Frixel Basin, this is a distribution of, of chloride in Frixel Basin. Uh, we use chloride in Frixel Basin uh, because salts, we find that salts can be influenced by uh, soil processes like mineral dissolution and cation exchange. Uh, chloride is, is a more conservative ion that doesn't precipitate in these reactions. So again, blue values indicate low salt contents, red values indicate high salt contents. These soils here are older soils and they have higher salt contents like you would expect. These soils here are, are younger soils, and you would expect them to have uh, uniformly low salt contents because they're young. What we find is that there's a difference uh, above and below 120 meters in these soils. Above 120 meters, uh, salt content is very low. Below that, we tend to have high salt contents. And we interpret these high salt contents at lower elevations as due to evapoconcentration along paleolithic margins. So in Frixel Basin, we find evidence of paleolithics up to 120 meters. This is also the location of this, that large terrace at 80 meters that I showed you in the beginning. Uh, and it was confirmed as a delta uh, by ground pitting terrain radar. So that places a lake at 80 meters uh, in this region. So in summary, we find evidence of paleo lakes up to 300 meters in Bonnie Basin, uh, but we find, only find evidence of paleo lakes up to only 120 meters in Frixel Basin. So based on those paleo lake heights, uh, we can reconstruct Pale Lake history in Taylor Valley. So during the last glacial maximum, uh, Pale Lakes were only dammed uh, up to 300 meters in Bonnie Basin. Uh, this suggests that uh, these Pale Lakes were dammed by a lobe of the Ross Sea ice sheet that, that filled all of Frixel Basin. During the retreat of this ice sheet from uh, Taylor Valley, uh, smaller Pale Lakes formed in both eastern and western Taylor Valley up to approximately 120 meters. And this is the, the present configuration of ice masses and lakes in Taylor Valley today. So in summary, uh, using soluble salt accumulations, we find that during the last glacial maximum, uh, uh, there were pale lakes dammed in Bonnie Basin up to 300 meters by an ice mass that filled eastern Taylor Valley to 300 meters. And uh, finally, that uh, after the last glacial maximum, uh, smaller pale lakes formed in both eastern and western Taylor Valley. This is very different from previous reconstructions. Uh, on the top, this is a reconstruction after Hall Vault 2000. Um, and on the bottom is the reconstruction based on this thesis. So our reconstruction has a much smaller size of the Paleo Lake. It's only dammed in Bonnie Basin. And also, the Rossi Ice Sheet is, has penetrated much more deeply into Tail Valley. In contrast, uh, this uh, reconstruction has a much larger Paleo Lake. So we find that soluble salts in Taylor Valley are not just influenced by pale lakes, they're also influenced uh, by soil processes. And the first clue we had of this was uh, by looking at the distribution of compositions across Taylor Valley. Uh, in Bonnie Basin, we find that the composition of these soluble salts are, are similar to seawater. 
uh, this is what you would expect because uh, this is the source of salts to these soils. It's primarily seawater aerosols. Uh, however, in eastern Taylor Valley, we find that salts are, are very different from seawater. They vary quite a bit, and they're sodium uh, bicarbonate composition. And that suggests that these soils have been influenced by soil processes. And in particular, uh, the formation of, of sodium bicarbonate salts is a well-established process uh, that happens due to exchange reactions. This was established by very uh, early research, um, Mondesir 1888, so I guess to cite someone from 1888, uh, is one of the first uh, researchers to look at this. Okay, so in the next uh, section of this presentation, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to examine in detail how cation exchange reactions uh, could influence uh, soluble salt accumulations in Taylor Valley. Okay, so first, what are exchange reactions? Uh, so, uh, on so the surfaces of, of soil particles, there are negatively charged sites. These are called exchange sites. And attached to these exchange sites are positively charged ions in solution. So here, if I show negatively charged uh, sites on the soil surface, and positively charged calcium is attached to these exchange sites. Uh, cations that are attached to exchange sites can undergo something called cation exchange. So if I add sodium chloride uh, in solution uh, to the soil, what can happen is the sodium can come in, replace the calcium, and that calcium then goes into solution. So this can really uh, alter uh, the composition of soil solutions. Uh, these are the steps by which uh, sodium bicarbonate forms in soils from cation exchange. Uh, first, when soils are initially deposited, they tend to be high in exchangeable calcium. Uh, this is due to the dilute nature of, of depth-initial waters, and also uh, because depth-initial waters usually have high calcium content. Later, when sodium uh, marine aerosols start accumulating in the soil, uh, sodium from those marine aerosols can exchange with calcium on the exchange sites. So here in this reaction, X stands for an exchange site, calcium is bound to those exchange sites, and sodium and the fluoride uh, exchanges with that. And that produces a, a calcium chloride uh, solution. That calcium chloride then uh, leaches from the soil and leaves the soil uh, with the uh, sodium-enriched exchange sites. So if you add water to a soil that has a high exchangeable sodium content, what can happen is that another exchange reaction takes place. In this exchange reaction, uh, uh, calcium from calcium carbonate, or calcite, can exchange with the sodium uh, to produce uh, sodium carbonate. And this is uh, actually what we find in uh, dry valley soils. Uh, this also predicts that you'll have a very high soil pH. And we measure the pH of soils in Taylor Valley, we find that the pH is around 10. So it's extremely high. So there are two important predictions uh, from this process that we're going to look at in more detail. Uh, the first is that uh, it will produce uh, sediments high in exchangeable sodium near the soil surface. This is because sodium from sodium chloride is attached to the soil. Second, it predicts that uh, calcium chloride brine will be produced at, produced at depth in the soil. So we want to look at this critically, and the way we decide to do that is to sample a, a single soil in Taylor Valley uh, in detail to depth. So soils in eastern Taylor Valley are uh, ice cemented. Uh, this is when the, the soil is saturated with water and it's frozen, and it produces a soil with the hardness and consistency of cement. So the way we sample this is we use something called an auger, auger drill, and we would drill into the soil and then take it out and collect the tailings. We froze these tailings and transported them in a freezer to uh, University of Washington. And here what we did is we, we melted those samples and extracted the water and analyzed uh, what the soil salts were in the soil to depth. We also took the soil and measured uh, what the exchangeable cations in the soil uh, were composed of. Uh, and what we found is, is evidence of calcium chloride enrichment in this porthole. So near the soil, so you can see it on the left, uh, this is a graph of the anion concentration in the soil uh, versus depth in the soil. And what we find is that the, the soil is primarily composed of chloride ions. On the right is the distribution of cations with depth. Uh, near the soil surface, we find that uh, the soil is rich in sodium, this is blue diamonds. Uh, further at down in depth, it becomes enriched in calcium. This is calcium chloride. Uh, even further than that, you can notice that sodium again increases. Uh, at this point, the borehole actually entered into different sediment. 
this was fine green sediment, it was probably uh, lacustrine deposits. Uh, so we also find that uh, exchangeable cations conform to our, our predictions of what should occur from cation exchange. Uh, near the soil surface, exchangeable sodium is very high, there's the blue diamonds here, and exchangeable calcium is very low. And that suggests that uh, sodium has accumulated in the upper soil and displaced calcium from the exchange sites. That calcium is then migrated downwards into the soil as a calcium chloride brine. So these trends are exactly what we predict from cation exchange. So what we want to do next is we want to model this process in the borehole. And by modeling this, what we're really doing is we're, we're testing our understanding of to see if we really understand how this works. So on the left is a, a, a simple diagram of, of the process we're going to model. Basically, we have salt accumulation at the surface. These salts are then transported down the soil uh, to depth. As the salt migrates down the soil, it reacts with the soil. This can be modeled with something called advective dispersive reactive transport. Uh, and this is an equation that's kind of scary, uh, but you don't have to get it too long. In this equation, uh, C is the ion concentration traveling downward. Uh, v is the average uh, velocity of the brine as it migrates. Uh, T is, is the time uh, of, of how long transport occurs. Uh, we specify the time uh, during which transport occurs by actually dating the soil using luminescence dating. This is something I'll go into more uh, later in, in this, uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, but we found that the soil is, is 5,000 years old by luminescence dating. Uh, X is the depth of the soil. Uh, Q is the reactive phase. So that is, uh, on the right, this is the uh, reactive component of this transport equation. Uh, in this case, it's exchange sites. And D is the dispersion coefficient. So the dispersion coefficient is, is just a measure of how the brine spreads out, how it diffuses outwards uh, as it's being transported downwards. We assume a value of 10 to the minus 11 meters squared per second. This is a value that's typical for frozen soils. So before we can actually model transport in the soil, there's a couple things we need to do. Uh, first, uh, we, need to develop a, we need to develop a, a geochemical program to model low temperature concentrated solutions. Uh, the reason for this is that um, we're, measured, we're modeling frozen soils. In frozen soils, you have very high solution concentrations, and you also have low temperatures. Uh, second, uh, we needed to determine what the cannabis exchange properties were for Taylor Valley soils to see how they would interact with exchange sites. And finally, we needed to parameterize the model. So the geochemical models we decided to use are Freak and Freeze Chem. Uh, freeze Chem is a model uh, that can uh, uh, look at evaporation and freezing of, of concentrated solutions uh, from a temperature range of minus 70 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, Freak is a transport model that can look at uh, reactive transport. Uh, however, uh, well, so both Freak and Freeze Chem can model concentrated solutions, and they use the same approach. It's called the, the pitcher approach. However, Freak uh, is only parameterized to, to do the Pitzer approach at 25 degrees Celsius, whereas Freeze Chem can look at low temperatures. So in order to use Freak to, to model transport, what we had to do is this, and this looks kind of ugly, but basically what we did is we took the Pitzer parameters in Freeze Chem and we incorporated them into Freak. Uh, so the Pitzer parameters are the same uh, between Freak and Freeze Chem, but the equation that specified those parameters are uh, dependent on the temperature, and those equations are different for, for freeze chem and for free. So what we had to do is take the equations from freeze chem and convert them into a form uh, that was readable by free. And we did this by a least squares regression analysis. So when we take the freeze chem parameters and put them in the freak, we have a new model called super free. Uh, we verified this model uh, by modeling uh, uh, freezing of seawater. Seawater is kind of the gold standard in this. Uh, in this graph, you have the, the temperature of seawater uh, versus the, the concentrations of ions in solution. And the solid lines in this graph are uh, what we get from modeling with Freak, and the, the circles in this graph are what we get from modeling with Freeze Chem. And the main point is that they agree exactly. So uh, Freak can reproduce the results of Freeze Chem uh, very accurately. So basically, we now have a model uh, that can do everything that freeze chem could do. It, it can model uh, very low temperature solutions, uh, but it also includes transport functions and cation exchange functions. 
So next we needed to uh, specify uh, various parameters for the model. I'll go through these quickly. First we needed to determine the average brine, uh, velocity of brine moving downwards in the soil. We did this using uh, nitrate. So nitrate in, uh, in aquatic systems in Tyler Valley is, is typically low, and this is because it's scavenged by, by life. Life likes nitrate. Uh, and so the initial nitrate composition of the borehole was probably very low. But we find that nitrate concentrations are actually uh, very high in the upper borehole. So that suggests that that nitrate came from the surface. So we look at the extent of the nitrate penetration to depth. So we get the depth of penetration of the, the surface brines. And since we know this, the, the soil age is 5,000 years, we can determine a rate, which is 0.3 millimeters per year. Next, we needed to determine a, a temperature, uh, temperature of the borehole. <coughs> we did this using uh, this scary equation. Um, basically, what this equation does is it, uh, is it uh, models the seasonal oscillation of temperature, uh, and it looks at uh, damping of those temp temperature oscillations uh, with depth. We calibrated this equation using uh, temperature data from a nearby meteorological station at Lake Fritzel. And we took the average temperature field uh, during the summer months, which is when downward transport will occur in the soil. So next we needed to specify what the salt influx was to the soil at the surface. We did this by looking at uh, salt compositions in a nearby Canada glacier that was studied by Lyon et al. 2003. And finally we needed to specify what the initial conditions were in the borehole. We specified the, the initial conditions as the, the borehole composition between uh, 150 and 180 centimeters depth. This is below the front of the downward advecting brines, but above the little cushion sediment at depth. And this was an assumption. Okay, so next, we're getting there for the transport model. We needed to uh, determine what the, the exchange properties uh, were of the soil. Uh, and the way you do this is you take a, a, a solution of a known composition. On the right, I have uh, uh, exchange experiments for calcium and sodium exchange. So you take a solution of, of a known composition, in this case, uh, uh, varying portions of calcium and sodium, and you add it to the soil, and then you, you measure what the distribution of, of cations uh, are on the soil. So on the x-axis here is the percent of calcium that was in the solution. And then the y-axis is the percentage of calcium that was found on the exchange sites. So if there's 50% calcium in solution, uh, then there's the other 50% in sodium. This is this calcium to sodium exchange. And we did this uh, in a, a relatively dilute solution, uh, 0 0.1 molar. And we also did it in a very concentrated solution, 4.75 molar. We measured this uh, for very concentrated solutions because in freezing, you get very concentrated solutions. So I'll walk you through this. Uh, but this line here is uh, a line of equal partitioning. What it means is that if you have 50% calcium in solution, you get 3% uh, exchangeable sodium. So this indicates that there's no preferential uptake of calcium on the exchange complex. Points lying above that line indicate that uh, calcium is preferentially absorbed onto the soil. Points lying below that line indicate that sodium is preferentially absorbed in the soil. And what we find is that the, the more concentrated solutions preferentially absorb sodium. So, so this 4.75 molar solutions uh, tend to absorb sodium much more strongly. And that's surprising uh, because in most soils, uh, in dilute systems, uh, it's calcium that actually absorbs more strongly. But we find that in more concentrated solutions, uh, the, the reverse occurs. And this is a common effect that's been observed in soils. And so, uh, what this indicates is that when you freeze soils, uh, sodium will be absorbed onto the exchange sites, and that will cause calcium to go into solution, and that will produce a calcium chloride enrichment in the soil. So calcium chloride enrichment uh, occurs naturally from freezing. So one final step before we actually show you the, the transport model results. And uh, so the transport is modeled in frozen soil. Uh, and we want to compare the transport model to measured trends in the borehole soil. But the borehole soil is, 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 is thawed. It's measured in its thawed state. So to compare the two, we need to uh, model freezing of the borehole soil. Uh, and we did this using free, using the temperature profile I showed you before and measured ions. And this is the distribution of ions when you model them uh, freezing in the borehole. 
Um, what we find is chloride uh, concentration increases with depth. This is due to the lower temperatures found at depth in the soil. We also find that there's a very significant uh, calcium chloride enrichment at depth in the profile. This calcium chloride enrichment is actually even stronger than in the thawed borehole, and this is because of the, the exchange that occurs when you increase the solution concentration. So this is the, the uh, transport results. Uh, this is when we model transport in the soil for 5,000 years. And what we find is that we predict that there is a, a calcium chloride enrichment at depth. Here you can see calcium uh, is very high with respect uh, to sodium. We also find that the, the trends in the transport model uh, accurately predict the trends we find in, in the model of uh, frozen borehole. So in these uh, graphs here, I show aqueous ions on the left, exchangeable ions on the right. And the, the colored data points are the data points that were modeled in the frozen borehole. Uh, the black data points are data points that were modeled uh, with the transport model. And again, we find that they, they agree very well. So calcium chloride brines are, are particularly interesting because they're found uh, throughout the dry valleys. Uh, in particular, they're, they're found in groundwater throughout the dry valleys. This here is a picture of groundwater that was found in Taylor Valley. And these groundwaters typically have calcium chloride composition. This is a photograph of Don Juan Pond. Uh, Don Juan Pond is one of the more uh, interesting chemistries on Earth. It's a pond that's uh, composed almost entirely of pure calcium chloride. So it has a very high concentration, a chloride concentration of 6.5 molar. And that's balanced almost entirely by calcium, 3 molar. Don Juan Pond, even though it's at the surface, is actually a groundwater brine. Uh, the pond water is, is sourced from upflowing uh, groundwater at depth. So what we think is that uh, this me mechanism of calcium chloride formation uh, by cationic exchange can explain this calcium chloride enrichment that we often observe in these dry valley groundwaters. So in summary, uh, our investigation of soil processes indicates that uh, cation exchange reactions can result in both sodium bicarbonate uh, enrichment in the upper soil and calcium chloride enrichment in the subsurface. Uh, we also find that this calcium chloride enrichment mechanism can explain uh, the calcium chloride that we often observe in, in dry valley groundwaters. So in the next section, I'm going to take uh, go in a, a little bit different of a direction. Uh, one of the original goals of this project was to be able to uh, date soils using salt accumulations by looking at how much salt is accumulated in the soil. Uh, but when we investigated all these soil processes, we found that you can't really use salts because it, it reacts with the soil. It's not just sitting there. So in order to date soils, we turned uh, to luminescence dating. And we uh, decided to date terraces in Taylor Valley because these terraces are, are vital to our understanding of the Paleolithic history in Taylor Valley. So terraces are actually, have already actually been dated. Uh, they've been dated uh, by C14 dating of algal layers that are buried uh, in the terraces. And these ages uh, are thought to describe uh, the history of lake levels in Taylor Valley. These are two photographs of algal layers that uh, appear in these terraces, and they appear to be layered and in situ deposits. This is a graph showing uh, the, dist the distribution of terrace C14 ages uh, with elevation. And you find that uh, the C14 ages have a clear trend with elevation. Uh, they tend to decrease in age at, at lower elevations. And this is thought to represent uh, a lake level history of gradually lowering uh, lakes, although with many fluctuations. So these, uh, the ages of these terraces, uh, since it's so important for determining uh, the Paleolithic history in Taylor Valley, uh, we decided to get a second opinion, and we got that second opinion using luminescence dating. So this is uh, some of the basic theory of luminescence dating. Uh, in luminescence dating, uh, what happens is that radiation impinging on uh, mineral grains in the sediment can cause electrons in those minerals to get bumped up into metastable states within the, the mineral structure. Uh, by metastable, I mean that those electrons will stay there until enough activation of this energy is provided to those electrons to knock them out of those states. Uh, sunlight can actually provide this activation energy. So sunlight, when it hits uh, minerals that have electrons in these metastable states, it'll knock them out, 
and cause them to drop down to a lower energy state. When that happens, you release uh, light in the process. So how this actually works uh, for dating, in this graph here, uh, we have time on the x-axis and luminescent signal in the y-axis. And we find that as sediment is transported, uh, the sediment is exposed to sunlight. So this effectively uh, removes all the electrons from the metastable states, and it zeroes the luminescent signal. When that sediment is then deposited, it's exposed to radiation in the surrounding sediment. That radiation uh, causes electrons to accumulate in metastable states. That causes the luminescent signal to, to grow. So in the lab, what we do is we measure uh, how much radiation the sample received during burial, and then we measure uh, the dose rate in that sediment. And by dividing the radiation uh, received by the dose rate, we can calculate an age for the soil. So we uh, sampled a number of sites in Taylor Valley for luminescent stating. We sampled a total of 13 terraces. Ten of these terraces have already been dated with C14 dating, so this allows us to compare uh, two dating methods. This is just a, a little diagram showing uh, you how these uh, uh, sediments were, were sampled for luminescent dating. The key in uh, luminescent sampling is that you don't want to have the sample be exposed to any light. So what we did is we, we took these hollow tubes and we pounded them into the soil and extracted uh, intact pores in the soil that way. So in the luminescence dating, we use a single grain analysis. On the left is an image of a luminescence auto sampler. It's, luminescence dating is actually pretty high tech now. So what we do is we take uh, discs that look like this, and we, we load those discs with, uh, with uh, grains. And so uh, what the machine does is it goes through and it analyzes the age of every single one of those grains. So when we uh, figure out uh, a luminescence uh, age, we're actually looking at age distributions. We're figuring out the age based on uh, hundreds of grain uh, of single ages. In this graph, we have, uh, this is a histogram graph of uh, single grain luminescence ages. And the age of the sample is actually about five, 6,000 years. So that corresponds to uh, the spike in, in ages there. So these are the luminescence results. Uh, we decided to employ both uh, quartz and feldspar luminescence datings. Uh, quartz is, is the gold standard in, in luminescence dating. Um, however, it's often difficult to date quartz in, in the Dry Valley, so we also turn to, to feldspar dating. Uh, these quartz results were done uh, by Glenn Berger down at the Desert Research Institute. And what we find uh, is first, uh, the quartz and the feldspar dates are, are consistent. That's good. Uh, we also find that uh, the C14 ages are, are much, much older than the luminescence ages. On average, they're about 7,000 years older uh, than the luminescence ages. And in fact, this, uh, this uh, age difference is actually an underestimation because uh, I presented uncalibrated C14 ages here. If you calibrate those C14 ages, they'll actually be 1 to 2,000 years older. So the actual age difference is more like 8 to 9,000 years. So why are the C14 ages older? And uh, we think this is the simplest explanation, and it's that the, the carbon-14 sample samples are not from the same sediments as the luminescent samples. In particular, the C14 uh, samples are from older sediments. Uh, the reason we, we come to this conclusion uh, has to do with the fact that the C14 ages are very similar to uh, glacial lacustrine sediments uh, throughout the Taylor Valley. That suggests that they're both the same age. In this uh, graph here, we have uh, the age of C14 ages and luminescence ages in Taylor Valley versus elevation. These black dots are the ages of terraces. Uh, and overlaid on that are these uh, white dots, which show uh, the ages of nearby glacial lacustrine sediments. And you find that they, they overlap each other very well. It suggests that they're, they're both dating not only the same sediments, but the same event. On the other hand, Luminescence ages uh, tend to be much, much younger. This suggests that they're, they're dating both younger sediments and younger events. We also find that the character of the sediments uh, sampled for these, in these two dating techniques are very different. C14 uh, samples tend to be very silty, and they tend to be very abundant in algae. On the other hand, uh, when I sampled for the, uh, luminescence dating, uh, the sediments contained no algae, and they tended to be very coarse-grained. So finally, 
how do we interpret these terrace ages? Um, in this graph here, I show uh, on the top panel is the deuterium record at Taylor Dome in Vostok. And this is against uh, the age. And the deuterium record is really a, a proxy for temperature changes. And here, what it's showing is that during the last last glacial maximum, you have cold temperatures. And then during deglaciation, temperatures increased. And on the bottom panel, we have uh, the C14 ages. And we find that these C14 ages are very well correlated uh, with the temperature increase that occurred uh, during deglaciation. As a result, we interpret these C14 ages as, as dating a, a deglaciation sequence in Taylor Valley as the uh, Rossi ice sheet retreated from Taylor Valley. On the other hand, uh, terraces occur uh, long after uh, uh, C14 ages. And these are associated with warm periods that followed uh, deglaciation. And so we uh, posit that these terraces were deposited during high stream flow events. So uh, warmer conditions will increase meltwater production from glaciers and increase uh, stream flows, leading to more fluvial sedimentation. You'll notice that there are no uh, terrace uh, luminescence ages uh, after 4,000 years. Uh, the climate in the dry valleys during this time period was characterized by cold and dry conditions, and these conditions would not favor fluvial sedimentation. So this is a summary of the luminescence segment of this presentation. Uh, we find that luminescence ages are much younger. They range between four to 10,000 years. C14 ages range from 10 to 17,000 years. Uh, the sediments are very different. Luminescent sediments are absent of algal material and they're sandy. C14 samples uh, have a lot of algae, and they tend to be very fine-grained. And finally, we conclude that luminescent samples are dating different events from C14 samples. Luminescent samples are dating high stream flows. C14 ages are at the glaciation history. So these are the overall conclusions of the dissertation. We find that using the soluble salt distributions that, you know, the rice Rossi ice sheet dammed high pale lakes and bonnie basin, during its retreat, smaller pale lakes from the tail valley up to 120 meters. We find that soluble salts are also influenced by soil processes. The most important one is catalytic exchange reactions. This produces sodium bicarbonate soils in the soil and calcium chloride brine at depth. And this calcium chloride brine production at depth can explain the composition of groundwaters in the dry valleys. And finally, we looked at terrace ages. Uh, Terrace ages, the C14 ages, we conclude uh, represent deglacial history, while the luminescence ages date uh, Holocene uh, stream flow highs. So I want to thank uh, my committee uh, for putting up with me for six years. Uh, and uh, there's many other people uh, who helped me uh, in the course of this research, who advised me and just kept me company. I'd especially like to thank my family. Uh, for supporting me during this time, and my friends, especially at the UW Climbing Club, who is representing today. Um, and finally, I would especially like to thank my wife, Lisa, uh, who brought these treats for us today, and always make sure I have a lunch. <laughs> um, yeah. So I leave you with this. I got this idea from Teresa's defense. Uh, this is my entire dissertation I put into Wordle.net. And what it shows you is the, the most common words I used by how big they were. So you can kind of get an idea of the <laughs> I think it's particularly funny that et et al. <laughs> Any questions? In some cases, uh, so most of the terraces uh, that we sampled, um, these were terraces that were also looked at by Michael Prentice with ground penetrating radar. And most of them were actually 